dan tidak Jangan biarkan orang lain mempengaruhi anda Kenapa si hak anda, keperluan anda dan perasaan anda Hanya sekali ia boleh meragut Suruhanjaya Integrity Agency Penguatkuasaan mengendali aduan orang ramai dan menjalankan siasatan mengenai salah laku pegawai penguatkuasa dan agensi penguatkuasaan dengan tegas, telus dan efisien. Sila layari www.taic.gov.my must ensure flood victims in rural areas receive aid. Flood situation worsens in East Coast states. And you're watching News at 10 with me, Brandon Lepal. Yang Deputuan Agong Al-Sultan Abdullah Raya Tudin Al-Mustafa Bila Shah called on the relevant authorities to play a more proactive role in providing aid to people affected by floods in rural areas. Al-Sultan Abdullah expressed his concern for the safety of those in rural areas during the natural disaster as they might get stranded and could not receive help as quickly as possible. His Majesty said this during his visit to a flood relief centre, PPS, at Wisma Belia in Kuantan. During the visit, Al Sultan Abdullah spent his time with the flood evacuees and presented aid such as antibacterial soap and snacks to alleviate their burden. PPS Wisma Belia currently houses 180 evacuees from 43 families. Meanwhile, 958 families in PPS nationwide have received aid from the Rural Development Ministry, KPLB. The aid received were in the form of necessities such as food, essential items and flood survival kits in the severely affected regions. According to a statement by its minister, Dr. Dr. Abdul Latif Ahmad, distribution began on the 27th of November last year until the 5th of January 2021. This involves several PPS in Kelantan, Trunganu, Pahang, Joho, Selangor and Perak. Furthermore, under the program Perumahan Rakyat Termiskin, PPRT, aid also encompasses house fixing, cleaning and restoration. Now, any parties, especially non-government organizations, NGO, wishing to provide humanitarian aid to residents affected by floods should refer to and register with the respective district officers of the areas involved. According to the Natural Disaster, or rather the National Disaster Management Agency, NATMA, Director General Dr. Dr. Aminuddin Hashim, this is to facilitate moderating and logistics. Apabila mereka hendak menghantar bantuan, sama ada bantuan dari segi barang makanan, sama ada bantuan dari tenaga kerja untuk mereka uh, menolong mencuci, membersihkan rumah-rumah ataupun pejabat-pejabat dan juga dari segi bantuan sama ada mereka counselling dan sebagainya, mereka perlu berdaftar di pejabat daerah dahulu kerana pejabat daerah tahu di manakah keperluan itu berada. Speaking at an event in the federal capital, he also said NADMA will ensure that standard operating procedures SOP in temporary relief centres PPS will continuously be practised by evacuees and rescue team personnel alike. Despite faced with the flood situation, all individuals involved are still subject to the SOPs and new norm practices. This is vital to prevent an uncontrollable spread of COVID-19 and giving rise to new clusters in affected states. 
Floods in Trigano persist as heavy rain forced 1,693 people from 269 families to evacuate their homes. In Kamaman, the number of evacuees continue to rise to 1,386 people in nine relief centres, PPS, and in Dungan, 223 affected individuals are taking shelter in two PPS. Disaster Management Committee Secretary Chief Lieutenant Colonel Che Adam Abdul Rahman said 13 PPS were open and the number of families affected increased to 269 from 238 earlier today. Over in Pahang, the number of evacuees from nine district rose to 21,779 compared to 18,976 this morning. According to the Welfare Department Disaster Info Portal, Maran recorded the highest number of evacuees at 5,431. Meanwhile, Ani Burhat, the concession holder of the East Coast Expressway Phase 1, LPT1, stated on their social media that both sides of the expressway at kilometre 113 and kilometre 115 were still closed. In Joho, aid relief centres were simultaneously closed due to fair weather, bringing the number of PPS down to 26 in six affected districts. According to Joho and Environment Committee Chairman R. Vidya Nandan, as of 4 p.m., there were 3,182 people from 807 families placed at PPS, compared to 3,566 people from 903 families at 8 a.m. The body of a University of Malaysia Pahang UMP student Ukai Iskandar Zulkarnain, 23, who went missing after being swept by strong currents in Kampung Gintong, Jerantut on Sunday night, was found at 9 a.m. this morning. Pahang Fire and Rescue Department Operations Commander Rosdi Mustafa said the body was found about five metres from where he was last seen. According to Rose Lee, the victim's body was then handed over to the police and sent to the hospital. During the incident, Ukai's father, an employee at the Gerontut Forestry Office, became the first victim of this year's floods in Pahang after he was swept away by strong currents while walking home with his three sons after he moved their car to higher ground. His two other children, aged 15 and 13, however, were rescued by the public. The search and rescue mission to locate both victims was stopped at 10.45 a.m. this morning. records new daily high of 2,593 COVID-19 cases. Now for the COVID-19 updates, the Health Ministry today reported 2,593 new positive cases in the last 24 hours, an all-time high since the start of the outbreak in Malaysia. Its Director General Tan Sri Dr. Noor Hisham said only four of them were imported cases and the remaining 2,589 were locally transmitted. Selangor continues to top the list of COVID-19 cases recorded by state with 965 cases, followed by Joho with 571 cases and Sabah 405 cases. Meanwhile, 1,129 cases made a recovery and were discharged today, bringing the total number of recoveries up to 100,578, which translates to an 80.2% recovery rate. This brings the number of cases currently active in the country to 24,347. 141 cases are currently being treated in intensive care units, ICU, with 67 of them requiring respiratory aid. MOH also reported four new COVID-19 related deaths today and the death toll currently stands at 513. The government has decided to extend the Enhanced Movement Control Order EMCO at Westlight Workers Hostel in Johor Bahru until the 22nd of January. Senior Minister for Security, Dr. Sri Isma Sabriako, in a statement said the decision to extend EMCO in the area was due to high infectivity rate among Westlight's residents. 
Dato Sri Ismail Sabri also said to date 555 positive cases in the area recorded from 1,303 screenings conducted. The senior minister also announced that Ipo sub-district will be put under EMCO starting tomorrow and expected to end on 20th January. The health ministry had confirmed that 106 positive cases were detected and scattered in the locality. From the figure, 89 cases are reported as locally transmitted cases in the last 14 days. Dato Sri Ismail Ismail Sabri said that MOH also confirmed that there were clusters still active involving factory areas concentrated in several industrial areas in the sub-district, which were at risk for the spread of COVID-19 infection. Tan Sri Anwar Musa has accepted his removal as Barisan Nasional Secretary General as announced by BN Chairman Datuk Sri Dr Ahmad Zahid Hamidi yesterday. Speaking at a special media conference in Putrajaya, he also thanked the party for giving him the opportunity to serve as Secretary General since 16 March last year. Elaborating further, the Katere AMNO chief also stressed that the duties of BN Secretary General can only be carried out successfully if there is mutual trust among the party's leadership. Saya akan kekal beristikamah, berpegang kuat kepada segala keputusan parti serta prinsip dan asas penubuhan parti itu sendiri, iaitu menyatu padukan orang Melayu dan umat Islam serta bekerjasama dengan sahabat-sahabat semua kaum. Saya juga berpegang kuat kepada keyakinan MN, BN dan PN yang telah membentuk muafakat sebelum ini sepatutnya terus diperkokohkan. Saya akan terus berjuang atas wadah perjuangan AMNO dan akan terus menyumbang ke arah AMNO yang bermaruah, AMNO yang berintegriti dan AMNO yang kekal memimpin penyatuan ummah dan menunjangi permuafakatan nasional. His post as Secretary General has been given to Datuk Sri Ahmad Mazlan. In another related development, Sembrong AMNO Division Chief Datuk Sri Hishamuddin Tun Hussein expressed hopes that the Supreme Council MKT will make the best decision during the meeting tonight for the betterment of all and not simply for the benefit of the party. He said the highest priority must go to the Rakyat's welfare amidst the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Through a media statement, Dato Sri Hishamuddin emphasised that the Rakyat's hopes towards political party leaders should be the cornerstone of all political endeavours that far surpass the importance of personal gains. Whilst the country is still at war with COVID-19, AMNO leaders must shoulder the burden of steering the Health Ministry, Defence Ministry, as well as the Science, Technology and Innovation Ministry through the best course of action. This is of paramount importance to ensure the highest standard of service can be constantly delivered to the Rakyat. Thus, any other factors that may hamper this effort must be set aside. Meanwhile, Perikatan Nasional appointed 14 State Liaison Committee BPN chairman today, including Senior Minister for Economy Dr. Sri Muhammad Azmin Ali as Slango BPN chairman. According to a Facebook post by PN Secretary General Dr. Sri Hamza Zainuddin, all appointments were made by Prime Minister Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin, who is also the PN chairman, after a meeting with the PN Supreme Council on Tuesday. In a media statement, Dr. Sri Azmin Ali said he is honoured to be given such responsibilities and promised that he will strive to solidify Selangor's PN strength. Dr. Sri Azmin also said Selangor's BPN will carry on with the pro rakyat policies to drive new economic growth and to ensure that services are delivered according to the highest standards to the rakyat during this challenging period. He added that the Selangor PN will continue to boost unity and solidarity between the rakyat to ensure that they can participate in the development of the country. The senior minister also called on all of PN party leaders, component parties and grassroots activists in Selangor to create quickly come together as a unified team in order to improve the country and the livelihood of the people. In other news, almost 12,000 manpower are required to fill in vacancies for the East Coast Rail Line construction project this year. The numbers are projected to grow to 23,000 
by the year 2022 and 2023. Economic analyst Dr. Aimi Zulhazmi Abdul Rashid said the project needs to be on the track as it will have a massive impact on the country's economic growth following the cancellation of the high speed rail project HSR Qualis Lumpo Singapore. Project Israel ini juga dapat membantu memperkembangkan pelabuhan-pelabuhan Malaysia untuk menjadi lebih baik dan dapat bersaing dengan pelabuhan negara jiran. Contohnya pelabuhan Tanjung Lepas dan Pangeran di Johor akan mendapat faedah yang banyak seterusnya merancangkan pembangunan ekonomi Johor khususnya yang terkesan dengan pembatalan projek HSR tersebut. In a related development, Malaysia Rail Link Sendirian Berhad, MRLSB and China Communications Construction Company Limited CCCC have agreed for the China multinational company to appoint local subcontractors and suppliers for at least 40% of the civil works of the ECRL project worth nearly 10 billion ringgit. In a statement by MRL SB chairman Tan Sri Muhammad Zuki Ali said, to date, a total of 403 local, including 212 Bumi Putra contractors, have passed the pre qualification process and have already been registered in online registration system. The ECRL project is progressing smoothly and slightly ahead of schedule, with overall completion rate stood at 19.69% so far. MRLSB targets for the overall completion rate to reach 30% the end of 2021. In the 1MDB trial of former Prime Minister Datuk Sri Najib Tun Raza, former 1MDB CEO Mohamed Hazim Abdul Rahman said today that he was aware that the company was owned by the government and was meant to be used as a front for collecting party funds for UMNO. Mohamed Hazim was responding to an inquiry by Defence team-led counsel Tan Sri Shafi Abdullah about the funny business that might took place in the company during the cross-examination session before High Court Judge. Colin Lawrence Sequera. According to Hazim, the information was relayed to him by Jolo. Tansri Shafi then refuted, saying the matter was not in accordance with company policy. Hazim claims that he was not aware about it and only knew of the company's involvement in the Tun Razak Exchange Project, TRX. Hazim, however, said he was not aware that the fund profits were to return for the political benefit of Datuk Sri Najib. However, when asked whether or not he has seen the money or contract granted to UMNO, he said he did not. Hazim also attributed Jolo as an individual who always presents himself as a representative to Datuk Sri Najib. Aside from Jolo, former aide to Datuk Sri Najib, Datuk Azlin Alias, and his special officers, Datuk Amhari Effendi Nazaruddin and Datuk Wan Ahmad Shehab, Wan Ismail told Hazim that Jolo had direct access to the former premier's cash. The trial is set to resume tomorrow. on calls for Senate control. That and more coming up in our foreign segment. But first, China's crackdown in Hong Kong escalated dramatically today with police arresting more than 50 opposition figures in their largest operation since a draconian security law was imposed on the financial hub. The sweep is the latest salvo in Beijing's battle to stamp out opposition in the semi-autonomous business hub after millions hit the streets in 2019 with huge and sometimes violent democracy protests. Police confirmed 53 people, including a U.S. citizen, were arrested for subversion in an early morning operation that involved about 1,000 officers. The charges were sparked by an attempt by opposition groups last year to win a majority in the city's partially elected legislature. Hong Kong security chief John Lee described the arrests as necessary and aimed at a group of people who tried to sink Hong Kong into an abyss. But the operation sparked a rebuke from Anthony Blinken, U.S. President-elect Joe Biden's pick for Secretary of State, who said authorities were launching an assault on those bravely advocating for universal rights. 
Now, Joe Biden's Democratic Party took a giant step today towards seizing control of the U.S. Senate as they won the first of two Georgia runoffs, hours before Congress was set to certify the president-elect's victory over Donald Trump. Reverend Raphael Warnock's victory, projected by multiple U.S. networks overnight, caped a grueling nine-week runoff campaign and puts Georgia's other knife-edge race in the spotlight for its potential to impact the balance of power in Washington. Should Republican lose the second race, it would be a political debacle just hours before Trump is expected to suffer another bitter blow when Congress affirms Biden's electoral college victory. Multiple Republicans have signaled they will try to block the certification of the vote. But their numbers appear slim and the House and Senate are all but guaranteed to reject the effort and certify the electoral college results. Warnock, 51, made history as just the third African-American to win a Senate seat from the South. He defeated Kelly Lovler, a 50-year-old businesswoman, appointed to the Senate in December 2019. Such result would be a major political upset in a GOP bastion, a southern state that has been reliably Republican for two decades, but which Biden won in an upset on the 3rd of November as he marched to victory against Trump in the presidential race. A fire at a Spanish care home killed an 89-year-old woman and injured 18 people. Firefighters today said the blaze at the Domus V. Adorea home in Sevilla in southern Spain broke out just before midnight on Tuesday. The Sevilla Emergency Services said in a tweet that this was the intervention of the emergency services in the resident's home in which an 89-year-old woman died and 18 people were hospitalized. Neighbors brought blankets and offered refuge in their own homes to elderly residents who were evacuated from the building. Many residents were taken by council workers to a sports center to spend the night. The Sevilla Emergency Services said the cause of the fire was being investigated. National football squad running out of time ahead of two crucial qualifiers. Now, the lack of international football matches throughout the 2020 season has caused concerns for the Harimau Malaya squad as two crucial 2022 World Cup 2023 Asian Cup second round qualifiers against the United Arab Emirates, UAE and Vietnam in March draw closer. Now, Football Association of Malaysia, FAM Deputy President, come National Team Manager Datuk Muhammad Yusuf Mahadi admitted that the national squad had limited time to prepare and pick up where they left off in their Group G qualifying campaign. Adding to his worry is the squad's performance level and on-field cohesion among players after an entire year without any centralised training camps due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Realising that the UAE and Vietnam operations, Dr. Muhammad Yusuf said, head coach Tan Cheng Ho and the national squad need to make the most of the upcoming centralised training camp from the 15 to 26 January, which will be the team's first since November 2019. After five matches, Malaysia is only two points behind Group G leaders, Vietnam, who have 11 points, with Thailand in third with eight points, UAE fourth with six points, and Indonesia at the bottom of the table without any points. Qualifying for the 2023 Asian Cup is a national squad's mission in the FAM F30 roadmap and after defeating Thailand and Indonesia in the previous group matches, Malaysia is currently on track to qualify on merit for the first time since the 1980 Asian Cup in Kuwait. Malaysia is scheduled to take on the UAE in Dubai on the 25th of March before taking on Vietnam on 30th of March. Jose Mourinho urged Tottenham to continue to perform well after Son Heung-min fired them into the League Cup final with a decisive goal in a 2-0 win against Brentford early this morning. It will be the club's first final in any competition since the 2019 Champions League defeat against Liverpool in Madrid. Manchester United are holders Manchester City who meet in the second semi-final on Thursday.
Ole Gunnar Solskjaer said Manchester United are playing confidently and should be able to win the League Cup and there will be no excuses if they fail to beat Manchester City in tomorrow's semi-final. United crashed out at the semi-final stage of the League Cup, FA Cup and Europa League last season but Solskjaer believes that they have made big improvements in the current campaign. The Norwegian added that there would also be no excuses if United lost the semi-final for the fourth time in a row. <laughs> the, the, the next game is always important, uh, but of course the semi-final is a chance to to get to the final, uh, to get your hands on a trophy uh, in the next round. And for this team, it would uh, be a very, very uh, big step getting to uh, getting your hands on a trophy. We've the club are second in the Premier League after a 10-match unbeaten run and level on 33 points with leaders Liverpool with a game in hand. Meanwhile, Pep Guardiola said Manchester City will need to rotate his squad as they go with injuries and a COVID-19 outbreak within the club. If you want to compete with all competitions, you need the full squad. But we have the second team that we trained with us since a long time ago, month. We know them quite well and I'm pretty sure they can help us. They can help us to, to, solve, to solve the situations, to solve the problems. But of course, with this amount, amount, amount of games, with just 15, 16 players, will not, will not be possible. City are now unbeaten in seven games and are only four points behind leaders Liverpool and Manchester United having played a game less. Now, the Premier League confirmed on Tuesday that 40 players and staff tested positive for COVID-19 in two rounds of testing over the past week but insisted the season would continue as planned. That figure is more than double the previous records of 18 positive cases and comes as England enters a nationwide lockdown to halt soaring infection rates. Twice weekly testing used during the project restart plan to complete last season has resumed in the Premier League after being scaled down to once a week at the start of the season. In the first round of testing last week, 28 positive cases were detected from 1,311 tests, with the further 12 positives from 984 tests in the second round of testing. Despite the postponements, rising case numbers and calls for a circuit breaker to buy time and bring infection rates down, the Premier League said it remained confident the season could proceed as planned. Due to the late end to last season, the English top flight is less than halfway through the 2020-21 campaign. The packed fixtures scheduled with domestic leagues, cup and European competitions having to be finished before the delayed Euro 2020 starting on 11 June leaves little room for manoeuvre in the calendar. That concludes this evening's news at 10. In our top story, authorities must ensure flood victims in rural areas receive aid. Join us again at 12.30 tomorrow afternoon. I'm Brendan LePaul. Stay tuned to Saloran Berita RTM and have a pleasant evening. Langkah pertama memerlukan seribu kekuatan. Langkah seterusnya memerlukan nekat dan juga keyakinan. Namun kita harus sokong dan bantu mereka kerana kepulihan itu pasti.